Okay, today is the day that we are going to look at some of the SWARM projects. So I'd like you to go ahead and present uh, what, what, what you did, your motivation for doing so, and then, and then your results. So Matthew is gonna go first. So go ahead, Matthew. Let's see what fun you had. I hope you had right. fun with these. These, these were supposed to be fun projects. Yes, this was a really fun project. Hang on, I'm trying to share my screen. I see you have a distraction there. Okay, you are muted, Matthew. He's probably talking to his distraction. One, two, three. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen. Um, you should be able to go down. It's going to open a new window. I'm sorry. This is... <laughs> oh, there it is. It's already selected. All right, can you see it? Uh, we can see your MATLAB. Yes, indeed, we can. All right. Okay, what'd you do? Just making sure. Okay, so my goal was to make uh, something called blobs. It's where every, so the field is going to be populated. And, oh, that's the wrong file. The field is going to be populated with all of these, what are called blobs. Um, each one is different size. The simple rule for each blob is that if the closest other blob is smaller than it is, it hunts it down and eats it. If the closest blob is bigger, then it runs away. And so here's it running. It stop, populates with random sizes. Okay, is this running in real time? This is not a movie. Yes, correct, this is real time. So as you see, this one is closest to this one. And so it's trying to run away. These ones I are see, okay. Away. And every time one eats the other, it takes on the size. There has to be a movie which is described by your scenario here. <laughs> there was a movie called The Blob way back, I think in the 1950s. I don't recall. And the, and the blob kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it consumed more and more. It was a horror story. So do you think this is an so, illustration of capitalism? <laughs> it, it could be without checks and balances. Without checks and balances, yep. So the simulation ends, of course, with... Uh, with one blob at the end. You go ahead and run one it again. Goal that I had. Go ahead and run it again okay. while you're talking. That 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 was that that's a fun uh, fun swarm. So okay. one goal that I had, um, if it if it if this was too boring, was if a blob goes a certain amount of time without eating something, it splits in half. Oh really? I didn't have time to program that in. Um, but I was going to be curious what the emergent behavior from that is. There's not a whole lot of emergent properties in this. Um, okay. This reminds me of Microsoft. It just took over by, about PowerPoint. It's taking Netscape to trial. Oh, it just got Windows Explorer. And now it's going to come over and uh, it's going to eat up Lotus 1, 2, 3 and make it into its Excel spreadsheet. There it goes. Okay, now um, Microsoft. What 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 is Microsoft? PlayStation. Is that what Microsoft is? Is, is that the product of Microsoft? The PlayStation. I believe Microsoft currently it's owns Xbox. PlayStation. Okay, oh, Xbox. Xbox yeah. Okay, Xbox. Sony does PlayStation. Okay, Xbox uh, it, it controls Nintendo. Okay, well that's fun. That's fun, Matthew. Very nice. Very nice. Who would like to go next on their uh, simulations? Uh, I can go. Okay. The, the fun thing about this is you can't find, I don't think, any canned software to do this. 
if you want to if you want to have any modicum of originality i suppose there's stuff out there with ants and pheromone but i didn't see it okay can you guys see my screen yeah okay so my motivation here was to reenact a six-year-old soccer game where um there are red, there's red team and there's blue team and there the ball is the little uncolored object here. Um, and I, I actually gave it just a little bit too much detail. I gave it offense and defense. And I recently watched a six-year-old soccer game and there is no offense and defense. It's just a big blob. So the rules are, if you're an offender, you run at the ball. And if you touch the ball, you kick the ball. And if you kick the ball, you kick it towards the goal you're trying to score on. If you're a defender, your goal is to find a random opponent offender and stand halfway between them and the goal. Um, and uh, this is this is how it happened. Um, so there's the the little blob that follows the ball around, and the defense actually gets some pretty good pretty good blocks in sometimes. Um, and then if you score, it resets and keeps track of the score. Um, so this one is not quite as interesting. It, it has a little bit of, of random motion, both in the kicking and the motion in the, in the movement itself. Um, but there's not a whole lot. Um, let's see, I think this is first to three. I scored it, real quick. You know, you know, a swarm is good if you start rooting for an up for one of the sides, you know, you, you go, go, right. go, go. Yeah, go blue, go. Right. Okay, uh, let's see. So here's another one where I added a little bit more of the wobble. So they're, they're, they're a bigger swarm. I also made it so that um, the defenders, instead of choosing a random offensive player, they choose a random enemy player. And so one thing I did notice is you get these, this kind of linear assortment of defenders where the defenders that don't move, the def the the opponent player they have chosen to stand halfway between the goal and the player is this other block who has, they've chosen each other. And so they don't move. And so when defenders pick, uh, there's this hierarchy of how, how many players removed you are from choosing the player that doesn't move. And so the defense forms a little line, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so that was an emergent property you had not expected. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, I mean, it's not super interesting, but it is, it is unique. I think that the defenders form a line, um, that expands the further away that the lob gets from them. Um, there's that one. And then I did that again with even more wobble. Um, so it's just a bigger blob and the, the, the behavior what, with the defenders. Your wobble is what I call worse. your wobble is what I call twiddle, but wobble right. is twiddle. twiddle yes, same I thing. Forgot same the word. Thing. Right. So yeah, the lines and the defense still exists. And then the, the defenders that aren't part of the line have chosen offenders as their target players to stand halfway between. Um so yeah, and it keeps track of the score and all the games are to three. Um, and oh, whoever got three one, sides. say it again. Whoever got three one, yeah, whoever gets the three first wins. Um, and I didn't do throw ins or anything, it just bounces off the walls if it hits the wall. Um, so yeah, um, oh, this I did notice game. after, after I, I wrote the program before I went to a six year old soccer game, and after I realized that the, this, these defense huddles just they don't exist at all. Um, and so. There's no concept of defense in kids. Right. Soccer. It's just, it's just, you run at the ball and then if you use the ball, you kick the ball and hopefully it's towards the goal and, and then the game happens. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank yes. you. That was, uh, that was fun. I have, uh, two things. Sam, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. How did you implement uh, what Dr. Marks calls twiddle in the movement? Cause I tried doing that uh, with my yes. players and didn't yeah, work good so, question. so each player um, each player is aware of the positions of all the other players and it, um, it creates a vector starting where the player currently is and then ending at the target. Um, and then what I did was I had a magnitude and direction of the vector. And then for the direction, I added a random uniform between 
uh, it depended on which twiddle level it was. But for example, between minus pi over four and pi over four, um, um, and so it'll their their vector towards the target will be centered. The the probability density is centered mm -hmm. at straight at the target, but there's a uniform likelihood that it'll go above or below the target as far as angle goes. And I also did for the magnitude of the walk. Um, I gave a little bit of a random speed increase as well. So all at any given iteration, their speed could vary between one to 0.5 to 1.5 of their normal speed. Um, so a, just a little bit of angle and then a little bit of speed, and then they formed that blob thing. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you, Sam. That was uh, that was also fun. I did find myself um, rooting for the red, you know, red state sort of thing. Okay, I like the red. Okay, uh, anybody else uh, like to like like to give it a whirl? Okay, Trevor, go ahead. I'll start. Uh, mine's a little uh, similar to um, Sam's. Different sport though. Uh, I was kind of inspired by the. <clears throat> the war games approach that I saw on the Neoswarm website, specifically the Spartan versus Persian one which Spartans could exit by going towards a desired goal. And so I thought, what if we uh, allowed the Spartans to pick up the goal and move it? Okay, and go back and explain, flag. go back and explain that again. It is a literal, literal capture the flag between Spartans and Trojans. Yes. Okay. So, just some general rules for capture the flag. Um, players marked with an O, um, they must get to the flag, which is marked with an X, which is currently on the other side of the playing field. <coughs> playing field is split in half. And then once a player on the opposite team crosses that line in the middle, then uh, the defending team can tag them. And then, you know, vice versa, if they swap over on the other side. Tagged players go to uh, jail, which I marked with a square on the map. Uh, jailed players can be saved by their teammates. However, they have to go back and cross that middle line before they can uh, attempt to go back on offense. And then if the player carrying the flag crosses the line in the middle, then the game is over. And so then additional swarm rules that I added Red team is offense, blue team is defense. Um, the red player closest to the blue flag has an incrementing threat level. And then the blue defender chases the uh, red player with the highest threat level, trying to keep them away from said flag. Um, and then uh, implementing a savior. Uh, when a red player is thrown in a jail, the person that follows them in the roster is designated as their savior. So they go run to the jail and try to break them free. And so uh, next few videos are just kind of a uh, showing how I implemented this step by step. So first, it goes a little bit fast, so I'll slow it down. But we see we have a uh, red player with a circle right here that approaches this X, kind of takes a uh, path meeting the Y axis, Y axis to the flag before grabbing it and crossing back over to that middle part in the center. And so then on defense, um, I've got it so that the red player starts on the same pathway and the blue player is just assigned uh, a spot on the field over here. As soon as that red player crosses, the blue player then attempts to intercept them, catches them, and you can see the red player ends up in this jail over here on the top left. Um, once that happens, the blue player then swaps over to offense, grabs the flag, and brings it back to the center. And so then the savior function, I've got two players on the red team running in for offense. As soon as the blue player catches the first one and swaps over to offense, this guy recognizes that he needs to go save his buddy, grabs and immediately the person from the jail runs over to the middle and the person as the savior runs to try and grab the flag before the blue player can cross. As soon as this guy crosses back over on his side, he attempts to go grab him by cutting, trying to chase the blue player coming back into the middle but isn't able to meet before the blue player crosses the middle line. Interesting. Okay. By the way, you're, um, you're, do, you're doing pursuit. This, I, I learned this from a, um, 
a Nazi expatriate that in pursuing a target, there's two ways to do it. There is the way that the dog does it, which the dog always runs towards the object, whereas the fox runs to where the object is going to be. In other words, the fox attempts to e extrapolate uh, how, um, how the rabbit is moving. And I guess both of them are, are, are chasing rabbits and um, attempts to forecast where it's going to be. And it runs towards the spot where the rabbit is going to be. Tries to intercept the rabbit. Yeah, it tries to intercept the rabbit with knowledge of that. This is fine, but you're, it looks like you're using the dog pursuit, right? You're running right towards the object at yes. all times. Okay, Correct. good. Um, Go ahead. Which then uh, causes the red player to miss the blue player. <laughs> and so finally, this is where uh, I reached a kind of uh, bump in the road is attempting to do a unfair game with 20 players on the red team and a singular defender on the blue team. Uh, I tried adding that uh, randomness that I asked Sam about on the red players if they were marked as chased by the blue player to try and avoid him. However, uh, I couldn't get it to work. And so we got uh, try and skip forward to here. So as you see, as it starts, We've got the red players kind of distributed widely across their playing field. We have the blue players starting on his side. Uh, as soon as it crossed, they all kind of mesh together to try and go straight for the flag. And the blue player immediately runs and starts just tagging them as they run across. Yeah. Um, the thing is, though, uh, um, in this scenario, a uh, the blue player deems one of the uh, players in jail and to have a higher threat level <coughs> and runs up to go tag him again, um, allowing a red player to go grab a flag. I have it. Um, and then noticing too late, the blue player attempts to go chase after the flag uh, and then follows um, one final individual to tag him before he kind of goes back to the jail. And so I was trying to keep track of how many times a red player was tagged in this scenario. Uh, and the blue player, <laughs> although he was by himself, he got a total of 103 jails um, wow. against the enemy team. Okay. Well, Trevor, thank you. Any questions on Trevor's implementation? It would be a lot more interesting with Twiddle. Um, we found that in the bullies dweeb sort of simulation. If you didn't have, if you didn't have, twiddle, uh, everything seemed to line up and the dweebs and the bullies would stack on top of each other. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that fun. So the yeah, twiddle kind of caused massacres and just yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Massacres in the boundaries, just like Alexander the great. Okay. Anybody else want to share? Uh, you might, if you need a little bit of extra time, that's fine. But if you'd like to share now, that's okay. That That's great. Get it out of the way. Sure, I can, I can go. Oh, okay, uh, okay, Colin and then uh, Ming Kun. All right, uh, let me share my screen. All right, are you able to see this? Yes. Okay, um, uh, so this is my Swarm program. It's uh, nothing super complicated. Uh, this is actually just a relatively uh, straightforward uh, differential equation. So. We have a bunch of uh, individual swarming agents in three-dimensional space, um, and their velocities change over time and are updated according to this uh, ODE here. Um, so we have uh, A times a delta V plus uh, C times a uh, capital delta X, uh, and then rho times S times a lowercase delta X. Um, so there are sort of three things you can control, um, or three primary um, variables to control. A is sort of an alignment coefficient. Uh, so the higher that coefficient is, the more likely a, uh, an individual agent is to align its velocity with some other agent that is within a particular radius of it. Um, C is a cohesion coefficient. Uh, the higher that is, the more likely the swarm is to pack together. Um, rho is sort of a uh, density um, value. So uh, this isn't a, a hard-coded value. This is actually computed uh, relative to some uh, radius around the agent. Uh, this delta v is the local mean velocity vector uh, minus the agent's velocity vector. Uh, this local mean is just computed in some small radius. Um, and this delta x is the same thing as the local velocity, except it's the difference in position vectors. 
And then this capital delta X is the global mean. Uh, so if we average up the positions of all agents in the swarm, um, then that would be this, this uh, capital delta X um, if we subtract the agent's position vector. You're going to be interesting when we get to a search algorithm known as particle swarm. It borrows on a lot of the uh, principles that you presented here. Now, in, in, in looking at these definitions, is it obvious to you from the differential equations that these parameters have the properties you've listed? In other words, A is the alignment coefficient. Uh, is that obvious to you? Um, well, so this was just sort of uh, from how I sort of defined this equation. Um, so uh, A here is, I mean, this is essentially like uh, intuitively, the, the higher the value of A is, um, the more sort of the, um, the higher the rate of change or rate of correction uh, any agent's velocity vector will have relative to uh, its neighbors. Um, so Okay. So if you did study this differential equation, you could make those relationships. Okay, fine. Thank you. Please go ahead. Please continue. Um, so here I just um, I wrote some Python code to um, simulate the swarm. And sort of this first simulation that I ran just did a, a localized cloud swarm. Um, so these are uh, the values I used um, for the uh, sort of flocking behavior. Um, and this is sort of the, uh, the behavior that I got. So maybe I can actually restart this. Um, so we have a bunch of distributed particles and they all kind of converge uh, towards uh, the center. Um, and then eventually they sort of reach a, a sort of stable um, uh, density, so they don't all pack together, but they uh, they don't completely diffuse. Um, so this was similar to that uh, Nats example yeah. on the on the Neoswarm website. Um, now, one interesting behavior that I uh, I found that I could get is that if you um, significantly, so if you fix the radius, uh, decrease the cohesion, increase the alignment, and uh, decrease the separation. Um, then you can actually get the swarm to sort of pack together into a tetrahedral arrangement. Um, it's kind of hard to see because it's not a perfect tetrahedral arrangement. Um, but over time, basically the um, swarm sort of reaches a, a stable state where the the uh, uh, basically the, all of the swarm is packed together as tightly as it can be, subject to the condition that the distance between all the, uh, the agents is uh, uh, no less than a, a particular fixed value. Um, so it's kind of hard to, I can't really orient it um, to where it's, it's really apparent, but. Um, well, this is, yeah, uh, this, this is interesting in a number of uh, essence. It has to do with COVID. Would you like to hear the COVID relationship? You know, we're supposed to keep uh, six feet apart. And if we are to keep six feet apart on a two dimensional surface, what is the optimal spacing that we should have? The answer is hexagonal. If you have a hexagonal relationship where, where each person is in the intersection of the, uh, of the hexagons, you will pack the room, pack a finite room with more people than you do, say, if you have a rectangular sort of separation. And I noticed that when I went to, uh, when I went to church, they would, have, they would have a seating arrangements and they would have person, space, space, person, space, space, person, then they would have between those and the row behind, they would have person, space, space, person, space, space, person. And that, that geometry ended up being a hexagonal sort of relationship. Um, there wasn't the six foot from row to row, but it, it did do pretty, pretty good separation, which was close to a hexagon. And what you have here is, what did you call this? A tetrahedron? Is that right? Yeah, so okay, well, like what a... this is is how you would space yourself if you had COVID, and this would get the maximum people in a three dimensional room. Uh, yeah, so that's that's probably the, the most interesting uh, behavior I, I ended up getting. That is interesting, by the way. You would get you want... would you, you would get the same result if you were to stack bowling balls. If you were to stack bowling balls uh, in, and or cannonballs, bowling balls, cannonballs, then if you connected the middle of all the cannonballs, it would end up being a, a tetrahedron, which looks like this, which is what gets the bowling balls as close as they possibly can. 
And if you're interested in this, you should take my class on multidimensional signal processing because we go over that uh, there. So, okay, you've, you've solved the three-dimensional COVID problem. Okay, so what else do you have here, Colin? This is, yeah, this is interesting. This is good. So this final one is sort of a diffusion. So maybe if you have like a swarm of, of uh, either insects or maybe these are drones, uh, you want them to be able to sort of uh, diffuse or uh, contract to a particular point. Um, you can sort of control this. Uh, um, so you can control the sort of cohesion parameter. Yeah. Um, and so if you really decrease the cohesion, uh, then sort of the radius of the swarm increases uh, up to a, a stable point. Um, so um, you can see the, the swarm is expanding, but eventually it sort of reaches a, a stable equilibrium where everything is moving fairly slowly. Now, a, let me ask you, can a particle leave the box or does it bounce off the edges here? Uh, no, so uh, because the cohesion is, is still non-zero, um, eventually it expands, but then reaches a stable configuration. Oh, okay. So yeah, th there's no bounding boxes here. So this would be an example of <laughs> try, try, trying to relate it to things I recognize, but there's a theory of the universe that there was a big bang and then there was a collapse and another big bang and there was a collapse. So it's kind of like that, I guess. And the, this is this is stationary. None of your parameters are changing with respect to time. Is that right? Um, so unfortunately, the the ODE isn't linear. Um, because oh, it is. I looked at it real quickly, and it looked linear. Where is it not linear? Yeah. So this this row value isn't a constant. Um, so this is actually we basically take a sphere around each agent, and we compute the density. Basically, it's proportional to the number of other agents within that ball. I see. So it is a nonlinear, okay, nonlinear relationship. Okay. Go back to your last example. That was fun to watch. Does it get together to be close to a point or does it? Um... So, yeah, kind of what I noticed here is that you had sort of, you know, rapid diffusion from the initial conditions, which are just selected at random. Okay. So it, it just restarted. Uh, so all the points sort of diffuse. Um, and then the velocity slow down. Um, and then eventually sort of once they slow down to a point uh, where the alignment um, component of the, o of the ODE takes over then they start to contract slowly. Um, and then they sort of like, you can com imagine like a sort of a spherical harmonic system that yeah. makes sense, um, where it expands and contracts. Um, okay, Colin, this was fun, great. Great, thank you very much. A lot of fun. Uh, Innocent is on the equator. Are you? <laughs> are you on the equator, Innocent? You're, you're sideways. <laughs> no, okay. no. <laughs> yeah, you're not on the equator. Okay. I think Ming Kun had uh, had his hand up next. Ming Kun, it's all yours. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, can you see my slides? We can see your slides, yes. But yes, your, voice, so, your, your voice sounds like you screamed all, all night last night at a, at a rock concert. Uh, can you can, can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but it's, it's, yeah, it's a little rough. But go ahead. I think we can make it out. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm typically examining the uh, particle swarm organization. And uh, this is the block diagram. So first we start with initialization of the particle with the random position and the velocity vectors. And uh, I have for each particle's position, we evaluate the fitness and uh, we get the best solution of the particles. And we also get the best solution of the swarms. And then we update the velocity and the position. And uh, we see if the iteration ends low, we just uh, go back and do the uh, and do the do the loop, and then. Okay, is is this is this the particle swarm optimization due to uh, Russ Eberhardt and Kennedy? Sorry. Did, did, did you find do you find this code on the web? Uh, what well, uh, this is the yeah, this this is something uh uh this uh I think this is the this. Uh, optimization typically does. 
And so I follow this. Uh, so I follow this uh, steps to do the uh, to do the uh, code. Okay. Uh, so yeah. let, let me ask you: Did you find this code on the web? Yeah, this one. Did you find the code for particle swarm on the web? It's a very, I think there's actually a MATLAB toolbox that uses this. Did you take it oh. from the web or did you write your own code? Yeah, I ran my, I ran myself. Uh, you, all of the code? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And uh, yeah, this is, so this is the uh, update formula. So I use this update formula for the code. And uh, so first step, I, uh, this is the initialization. I have the 50, uh, I, I use a one dimensional uh, functions to, yes. uh, to do this. And uh, so this is the initialization. And uh, my goal is to find the maximum value of this function. And uh, this is when I set uh, a self-confidence and the strong confidence to be both are two. So here, uh, so this is how, how it works. Yeah, I want you to notice this is really fascinating because with particle swarm, there's a number of false maxima there. Do you see it? Does everybody see that? Run that again, Minkun. That's very interesting. And uh, what these, could you go ahead and run it again? Yeah. Okay, that. thank you. And so what, uh, what happens is that the particle swarm optimization is able to filter out the, the false maxima and actually converge to the maximal maxima, which is pretty cool. And I have a lecture on this, which, which I will be giving. So uh, this, is, this is very interesting. One more time, because that's a really interesting result. Okay, so uh, this is the when they have uh, the self-confidence and uh, uh, strong confidence have the equal number. They are both two. So we can see the, uh, so about uh, at 100 iteration, it can reach to the, uh, all, all of them can reach to the maximum. But, uh, but if we have uh, something like, if we have the zero self-confidence and two uh, strong confidence, which means that everyone is not selfish. Everyone is contributing want to contribute to the society. So uh, the conversion time will be faster. We can see that uh, a few times and uh, it will iterate to the, uh, to the maximum, just uh, about 60. And uh, the next part, uh, the next part is that if the self-confidence is two and the strong confidence is zero. So what we can see is th this one. So actually, each particle just uh, uh, just find their best uh, value. So we just see that for the for the particles for all the particles, they just want to reach their uh, uh, their maximum of the nearby. They just uh, consider by themselves. What one of them found the minima. That's kind of kind of interesting. But this shows, I, I think this shows, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ming Kun, but this shows the importance in any search algorithm of proper choosing of the parameters that define that search algorithm. So if you don't define the parameters correctly, your search algorithm isn't going to work, as, as you can see in this example. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, anything else, Ming Kun? Yeah, okay. Okay, are you finished? Uh, yeah, yeah okay, finished. okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Hey, Dr. Said, Mark? Yes. A uh, quick question. I know last time you mentioned uh, the simulated annealing would kind of break uh, search parameters out of the or out of getting stuck in the local minima. Yes. Was combining that with the optimization uh, have helped? I, I think just random. Yeah, I think that simulated annealing would have also worked on the problem that Ming Kung looked like. I have asked uh, somebody who some of you know, Adam Goad, to share with you a specific instantiation of simulated annealing this coming Tuesday. 
So we're going to see an actual example of simulated annealing. And we'll talk about more, we'll talk more about that. But I would say that simulated annealing is an alternative to particle swarm for getting away from uh, getting away from the false maximum. You'll notice that the particle swarm that Ming Kung just showed was a multi-agent search. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of people on the landscape, all of them looking at their toes and saying, I'm here. And uh, what do I do next? And they also have walkie talkies and they're talking to all of the other agents. And they're going, where are you? What, what, what's, your, what's your fitness value? And they all cooperate. And by cooperating, they, find, they end up finding the maximum. Simulated annealing, on the other hand, is a single agent search. And it's a single agent which is exploring the maxima and minima. And it, it shakes itself out of, the, uh, out of the false maxima, usually. And we'll see an example of, of that when Adam Goad uh, presents his example of simulated annealing uh, next time. It's a really powerful technique. Okay, Innocent, on the equator. Do you have anything to show this, this week or do you need some more time? I uh, think I'll need more time because what I'm working on is not giving me the result I expect, but I'm trying to do something like have the swarm particles to locate, let's say, the hottest part in a room. So, which I try to like, if you're seeing the screen I'm sharing. Yeah, we can I, see it. I identified with it. Sorry? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, which I identified with this point, but running the program I have, they just keep running around, not being able to get to the... Well, here, here's, what, here's what I'd like you to do, Innocent, is when you get this ready, remind me at the beginning of a lecture, and then we'd, we'd all like to see it, okay? Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay. Well, those were fun. I, I hope you had I hope you had fun doing those. It looks like some of them were really, really well crafted. And it's kind of interesting to place those simple rules and see what the emergent property is. And that's that's the fun of swarm intelligence. And again, as is in that Harvard paper that we saw, uh, we do have a lot of interesting applications of swarm intelligence that we as engineers can indeed use. And in fact, we have a lot of physical phenomena. I mentioned swarms that don't move like the cells in the lung or the neurons in the brain that are basically swarms because uh, a neuron here in your brain doesn't know what this neuron over here is doing. That's especially true if we use the air back propagation, right? because we can update local neurons only knowing the interconnects that connect them with the other with the other neurons which is which is pretty cool if you think about it so that in essence is a swarm it's a, it's a bunch of dis, disassociated um, agents that work together to achieve a, a a greater cause okay with that let's um, let me go ahead and start some more with uh, talk a little bit more about um, about, let's see, where are we at? The autoencoder. Okay, I am going to share my screen. And I'm just gonna share my screen. I'm not gonna share the PowerPoint slide because I think that screwed me up last time. Here is the uh, autoencoder that we talked about last time. We have an input, we have a corresponding output, and the output is trained uh, to see the input. No, I don't want design ideas for my PowerPoint. Silly software. This is an example of feature creep. You have so many features they, they, that they become an obfuscation. Okay, uh, autoencoders. Uh, again, the idea is that we take these uh, neurons down here, and this is the input, and we take, for example, a bunch of pictures of cats, and we have the output of cats. 
And if we train enough, then this autoencoder, given the, given the picture of any cat, will output that same exact cat, even if it hasn't seen it before. One of the beauties of the autoencoder is something which is called um, feature extraction. Now, feature extraction is reduction of the dimensionality. We've seen, for example, that we have this curse of dimensionality. So it's a lot better if the input of the neural network has fewer, fewer inputs. And for that reason, we have this so-called latent space. And if we're putting pictures of cats in here and getting pictures of cats out here, this is, this is on, the, on the right is the decoder, on the left is the encoder. Uh, this middle is called the latent space. And all of this information in, these, in this latent space is sufficient to generate the cat. Because you don't even have to have this input here. You give, me, you give me something on the input, on the latent space, and it will generate, hopefully, a cat on the output. So all of the information of the cat is subsumed within this smaller waste, which is called the latent space, hence generating a reduction in cardinality. Uh, one of the places for an autoencoder is novelty detection. If you remember Justin Bowie's presentation the other day, this is what he was doing. Say that you um, trained a, an autoencoder on cats and you put in a cat, you got out a cat. Well, what happens if you put in a picture of a kumquat or a banana? Well, you would not get anything very exciting out here. And in fact, the autoencoder is trained so that your input is exactly the same as your output. If you give an input of say a comquat or a banana, your output is not gonna be the same comquat or banana, it's gonna be something else, correct? So what you can do is you can look at the error between the input and the output. Now, if the, if the input and output are very similar, then your error is going to be very small, isn't it? And if the error is very small, that means, well, you can probably trust that the input was a cat without even looking at the picture, because you know that the autoencoder passed the cat and it passed it with a little error. But if there's a big error, you, can, you know that, man, something's wrong here, that this, that this autoencoder has been presented with something and the output is very different than what it was presented with. So your, your big suspicion here is that the, um, there is not, that, that this autoencoder is not seen what your input is input, what your input is, uh, what your input is. I just needed to end the sentence earlier. Uh, here's an example to uh, signal coding, uh, to applications of signal, just noise. Say, for example, you had an autoencoder, and up here you have some noise. And uh, let me change the color of my pen because it will make it look more pretty. What you do is you take an autoencoder, for example, and you present it this part. Okay, you present it this part. That's supposed to be a straight line there. Okay, you present it this data, and that's the input and the output of the autoencoder. Then you go over here and you present it this data, and that's the input and the output of the autoencoder. Then you present it this data, and that's the input and the output of the autoencoder. So what you've trained the autoencoder to do is to recognize this noise, which I believe is, um, it has to be correlated noise. It's colored noise, which means there's a correlation to it. And, I, and so the, the, the autoencoder begins to recognize the noise. Now, the interesting thing about the noise is if you have a, add a very slow changing sinusoid to it, and that's what we have down here. We have the noise plus a little bit of the sinusoid. And that sinusoid, you can just barely make it out under the noise, right? But if you run it through the autoencoder at every point, this is what you get out you get out something which shows def definitively a greater pattern of the sinusoid. It doesn't give you back exactly the sinusoid, but it doesn't give you the, the result. It gives you the underlying signal, which in this case is the sinusoid. 
Uh, up here, this is even more, this is kind of obvious and I, I hesitated to put this in, but if you have the noise and you have a couple spikes and you put this in the auto encoder, this is the output of the auto encoder. Now the output, I'm sorry, the output error, and that's what I should have said. This is the output error. This is the input minus the output uh, magnitude or the magnitude squared. And so if, if you've seen it before, the error should be close to zero. Down here, this error should be close to zero. Up here, this error should be close to zero. So all of a sudden, it's not close to zero here. So you can say, you know what? That autoencoder hasn't seen this type of signal before. And that's exactly what happens here. You can, you can see it very clearly in the noise version here. And uh, same thing over here. It, it generates a spike in the noise and the autoencoder says, nope, I haven't seen that before. That is definitely an anomaly. So these are referred to as, on the previous slide, we called them, um, I guess I gotta use my arrow up. I can't get rid of my arrow. Where I shot an arrow in the air. Oh, maybe if I scroll. No, you think scrolling would work. You're kidding. My PowerPoint is not reacting very nicely. It's not playing well with the uh, with Zoom. So I'm just going to have to start and stop again. Okay. Um, one of the interesting things about autoencoders is that they implicitly learn. What do I mean implicitly learn? Well, for example, you learn cats. Well, if you learn cats, that means everything that's different from a cat, ideally, is going to give you a big error in that anomaly filter. Anomaly filters, by the way, are also sometimes called um, novelty filters. Anomaly detector, novelty filters, basically the same thing. And here is an example where things are trained on the mean, and the mean is right here. And you can see this is this was trained on a mean of zero for the spit for, for the previous example. So it was zero mean noise. So if you had something which wasn't zero mean noise, then all of a sudden you got big error out here that the output was not equal to the input. Uh, and down here, this was also interesting. This was the variance of the um, of the process, the variance, the, the, the stochastic variance, kind of the autocorrelation uh, variance. And here we see that there is a big area that the autoencoder is going to say, okay, so it was probably trained around right here, but it accepted really easily a bunch of data which deviated from that initial uh, variance, if you will. But if you got too far away from it, that variance went up. So there is an explicit learning because what it does, it gloms onto the feature that you're trying to represent and everything else is a big error and it gets away. Uh, here's another example is miss, missing sensor representation. And let me show you missing sensor representation. Suppose that you have two variables. This is x1 and this is x2. And let this be, for example, the, uh, the difference between the standard deviation and the variance. That's not important, but one is equal to x squared. Now, if you know, if you know the variance and somehow you forget what the standard deviation is, you can always come down here and you can do this curve and you can go down here and go, oop, right there is a standard deviation, whatever that is, right? So if you have a functional relationship or a, cor a correlation among your variables, then knowing one of the variables might give you a hint about the other variables. So with that, here's the idea be behind um, autoencoder missing sensor restoration. This we, we applied, we literally applied this to missing accelerometers on a Boeing aircraft engine. They used to put these accelerometers on the, on the aircraft engine in order to monitor the performance. And the interesting thing is, the, is that the electronics that failed the most 
in the engine was the accelerometers. Uh, but here's the interesting thing. Suppose you had these accelerometers around, and so you had a certain amount of wiggle here and here, and suppose that these accelerometers were close to each other. If, if this accelerometer was close to this accelerometer, wouldn't you expect that this accelerometer might have something to do with this accelerometer. And if for some reason this accelerometer broke, maybe we could figure it out from the remaining accelerometers if, if there was enough relationship. Now, clearly, if these are totally independent of each other, if you lose one, you're up a creek. But if there is a relationship between them, then eh, maybe you can do something. We know that there's a relationship between them. You know why? because we're able to take those, we have six inputs, we're able to take those six inputs and boil them down into two numbers, right? If you can take six numbers and boil them down to two numbers, that means that there's some relationship here among these six sensors in general. You can think of exceptions, but in general, there's going to be, there's going to be, um, in general, there's going to be a correlation. So the question is, if you lose this sensor and you lose this sensor, can you take advantage of the autoencoder to estimate what this sensor would have been and what this sensor would have been? And the answer is yes, if you train, with, if you train the autoencoder with a bunch of interesting data. And here's the way you do it. This, this is not as complicated as you think. Uh, you have you have part of your. Okay, I'm going to try this again. I'll probably have to reboot, but I'll live with it. Uh, you have a bunch of missing sensors here. These are the missing sensors. You don't know what these missing sensors are. So what the heck's going on here? These missing sensors have failed. So, but these over here are known. See that you have some known, and then you have the missing ones. You have the ones that work. You have the ones that don't work. So what you do is you place the, the known into the autoencoder and you get some sort of output. Now that output is not gonna be equal to the input, but that's okay. Because what we're going to do is we're gonna take these three values, these three values, and we're gonna feed this back to substitute these three values down here. So we take this part and we feed it back and, uh, that's our new values, our updated values for the three values. Now, we don't care about this part. We don't even care about this part. Why don't we care about this part? Because those are known. So this part up here, we, we literally just go ahead and we throw away. We don't, we don't need those outputs. So we stick in the known values here, and then we save this result and feed it back into the autoencoder again. Then we repeat the process. We repeat the process. We're going to get three new values up here. Again, we don't care about these because we know what they are, but we take these three values and we put them back in here. And we do an iteration around and around and around. And those that have taken multidimensional signal processing recognize <clears throat> that this is a form of alternating projections, right? Where you're, where, where you're projecting back and forth between two different domains. Uh, number one, the domain has to fit the known data. And number two, the domain must fit the autoencoder. So it must fit the known data. That's number one. Number two, it must fit the autoencoder. So we're making it fit the autoencoder. Then we're coming back. We're making it fix the autoencoder. Then we're feeding it back and we're making it fit the known values. And then by repetition here, we will hopefully, under some conditions, converge to these three missing sensors. Now, there's some, some assumptions you have to make. Um, one is that this is um, a so-called contractive operation, if you're interested in the math. But contractive operations are really interesting. Uh, one of my favorite is E to the minus X if you take e to the minus 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 x. 
In other words, you take you, you take on a calculator and you you keep hitting change signs e to the x, change signs e to the x, change signs e to the x, change signs e to the x. And what you get here is this converges to 0 0.567, if I remember right. And so what you're doing is you're performing an iteration where the next iteration is equal to the previous iteration raised e to the minus x. This turns out to be an operation which is known to, as a contractive operation. Now, uh, if you don't understand all of this, don't worry, I'm not going to test you on it, but it's just a little background of why this works. It's a contractive operation, and we know that this e to the minus xn is always going to converge to a fixed point, which in this case is 0 0.567. This is a generalization of that. It can be a contractive operator, in which case we're assured that we are going to have, uh, we are going to have a convergence here. And we are going to be able to relate and generate the lost values that we have. This is kind of cool. This has recently been generalized to deep convolutional neural networks and with deep convolutional uh, autoencoders. So it can be done for deep convolutional autoencoders also. Okay, I'm starting to get this down. One of the problems with, uh, there, by the way, there's other applications for uh, autoencoders too here. We've just, we've just touched two just like there's many applications to the neural network. And we're not, we, we've just, I don't know, we've talked about a few. One of the historical reasons which has been explored for uh, historical problems about neural networks, which has been explored for years and years, is that it is a black box. A neural network trained to classify objects, classifies an object, but you don't know what's going on, what made the neural network perform that classification. I will give you an old example of where that's the case. Um, in 1968, there was the National Democratic Convention. It turned out that Richard Daley, who was one of these very authoritative, authoritative mayors, was the mayor of Chicago then. And during the 1968 National Democratic Convention in which Hubert Humphrey was nominated for president, uh, since you don't know him, it's obvious that he lost. Uh, there, there, there were riots at the convention. And in fact, some of the newspapers called it a police riot. There were all these hippies and yippies there. And the yippies were just known for being people that kind of mess things up. They would go to $100,000 a plate Republican fundraisers raisers, and they would set out a a table outside and give away free bologna sandwiches. I mean, that was a, that was the sort of fun stuff that they did. Jeez, um, what else did they do? They spread this thing. Marijuana was very popular at the time, and they spread this rumor that you could smoke banana peels and get high, just like with marijuana. And in fact, there was a popular song at this time called Mellow Yellow by Donovan that talked about smoking banana peels and getting high. This was just a rumor. Uh, started by the yippies in order to uh, in order to mess with people's minds. Um, another thing they did is they took like a couple thousand dollars in one dollar bills. They went to the New York Stock Exchange. They looked at the observational ba uh, balcony and they threw the money over the edge. So all these dollar bills were floating down for all the traders and all the traders began to run and try to grab the dollar bills. And they were trying to make a statement about capitalism there. But anyway, they were some of the instigators of this, of this so-called Chicago riot. And in fact, there was a big trial called the Chicago 7 trial. And there was a there was an eighth guy, Bobby Seal, who, if you include him, it's the Chicago Eight. But I think it's normally called the Chicago Seven. If you go to, I think it's Amazon, you can look at a wonderful uh, documentary. Uh, it's not a documentary. It's what a, it's one of these I don't know historical sort of dramas about uh, the Chicago Seven of the 1968 National Democratic Convention. So this was terrible, and a lot of people said that Hubert Humphrey lost because of this police riot that happened with the hippies in Chicago during that convention. Well, a number of years rolled around, and the National Democratic Convention was again held in 
uh, Chicago. Uh, the previous mayor was Richard J. Daly. Now his son, Richard M. Daly, was the mayor. And they were so afraid that there would be a repeat of the hippie riots. So what do they do? They called in a guy, and I know him, but I'm not, but he, he was kind of a charlatan. He kind of made stuff up, but uh, he, uh, he came in and said, I can solve your problem with neural networks. What, if, what they wanted to do in order to avoid these so-called police riots is identify some of the policemen that would have tendencies toward violence. So they took this training set of policemen and all of these policemen that had domestic problems at home, domestic violence, that maybe they made an arrest and went out of line a little bit. And they took this training data, which was big and historical. They applied it to the neural network and they generated a number of members of the current, current 1996, the current uh, Chicago Police Department which and maybe would have, they, they would be dangerous. Let's not have them around. So they didn't fire these people, but what they did is during the National Democratic Convention is they placed them on leave. Well, uh, the Chicago Police Department Union said, nope, you can't do that. And they took, they took uh, Richard Daly to Richard M. Daly and the neural network to trial. And it turns out that the police union won. They could not use the neural network in order to indicate which one of the policemen should be laid off. Why was that? Because in any decision of this sort, according to the judge who ruled on the case, you had to have a plausible explanation of why you were laying off these policemen. You could not wave your hand and say this was a black box. This neural network said it was, so therefore it's true. And so there wasn't something called, and this is this is important, and neural networks still lack this, something called an explanation facility, which can tell you why a classifier or a regression machine has given a certain result. If you can't say why that result was reached, then... Um, you have no legal leg to stand on, according to the judge. So the role, role was reversed. So we've had this black box problem a long time, at least since uh, 1996. So that's been 20 some years. It's even, it's even older than that. And people are still looking at for this explanation facility associated with neural networks. In fact, the military, when they listed the, um, the criteria that had to be made for using AI in the military, one of their desires is that there be an explanation facility and that we have an ability to, uh, to, to figure out why a certain input gave result to a certain output. And then I'll end with, uh, with this story. This is another political application also having to do with Clinton. By the way, the 1996 National Democratic Convention nominated Bill Clinton, of course, who went on for success. And interestingly, historical, historically, there was no problems in Chicago during that convention. It turns out that the 1968 problems were due to the political climate at the time, which was totally gone in 1996. Here's another Bill Clinton story with neural networks. He was running for, um, for president, and it was the same convention. And uh, he wanted to find out, as all people do, but Clinton was really good because he had he had a war room. He responded very quickly. He realized the media was much more quick in responding to things. And so he had this, uh, what, he, what he called a war room, where people responded very quickly to any criticisms that people had of him. And they wanted to find out one of the things was who they should appeal to. Who were the swing voters in the upcoming election? And this was a column by Robert Novak, who as, as passed, but he, he at the time was a very respected conservative news column. He said, and I'm reading here, President Clinton's pollsters have identified the voters who will determine whether he will be elected to a second term. And those voters are two parent families who members, whose members bowl for recreation. How did they do this? I don't know how they did this. Again, I know 
I, I, I know the man that did this. He was kind of a charlatan in the area of neural networks, gave neural networks a really bad name. But, you know, people believe this. And Novak goes on in the second paragraph using a technique they called the neural network. Clinton advisors contend these family bowlers are the quintessential undecided voters. Therefore, these are the people who must be targeted by the president in his campaign. Kind of interesting. Novak goes on and said, uh, oh, by the way, uh, footnote, two decades ago, Illinois Democratic Governor Dan Walker campaigned heavily in bowling alleys in the belief he would find swing voters there. Walker had national political ambitions, but ended up in federal prison. So just because you campaign in bowling alleys doesn't mean that you're going to win. Okay, with this, I think, let me check the time here. The time is 37. Okay, we have a little bit of time. Uh, I want to start the, um, info, the, the, the talk into detection theory and some algorithms that are used on your cell phone today. And we're going to start with the idea of matched filter banks. Here's the idea behind matched filter banks. The, the idea is as follows. You have a bank of signals. Here's a signal, here's a signal, here's a signal. And what you do is you receive a signal and you want to decide, uh, is it this signal? Is it this signal or is it this signal? Which signal is it? And um, that's what you want to do. And what we normally do is take maybe the mean square difference. In other words, well, that black isn't showing up on black. So let me be, let me go to red again. So what you would do is you would take the F and you would subtract the G. And I don't care if this is in continuous time or discrete time, but you would want to minimize it, right? You would want to find the place in Euclidean space where they close us together, correct? And so if you expand that, if you expand the magnitude squared, you get this result. Now this F, this bracket notation means that uh, it's the inner product. It's the, uh, it, 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 it's the integral or the sum of F times G, if you will. Now, let's look at this expression kind of more carefully. Let's assume, first of all, that F squared, this value is the same for all things we're trying to minimize, right? For all things we're trying to minimize, this is the, that's the same value. So we don't even need that F because it's going to be the same. And if we just throw it out, we're still minimizing what's left. We are also going to assume that this G sub N, which is all of these elements in the filter bank, have the same energy. So we're going to assume that G sub N squared is equal to a constant for all values of N. In that case, minimizing this mean square error is the same as maximizing this inner product. And so we want to find, if you will, finding the minimum is the same thing as finding the arg. And this is a, this is a, this is a goof here. And this should be, this should be max. Okay, I gotta stop sharing and I gotta share again. This is called, we want the arg max. In other words, we want to maximize the inner product. This is referred to as a matched filter. We're trying to match whatever our received signal is. We're trying to match our received signal to one of these elements in the feature bank. It, it, yeah, in the filter bank, okay? So minimizing the mean square error is the same as maximizing the inner product. That's kind of cool. So this allows us lots of good things. Um, suppose, for example, we had, uh, in, instead of a filter bank, we just had two results. And those two results are a plus pulse and a minus pulse. But suppose they weren't in the filter bank, rather they were laid side by side in a signal where the signal decoded plus ones and minus ones. Is that okay? So now we have a bunch of these things. And what it says before is we should 
we should take uh, the do an inner product. And so we should do an inner product here, we should do an inner product here, an inner product here, an inner product here, an inner product at every step, and we should be able to uh, determine the result. So if we take this noise, this is totally noise up here, and we place down here the addition of this very severe noise with this result, and then we have a moving average which goes across here, which is a little pulse. So we put this pulse here, we put the pulse here, we put the pulse here, we do the inner product after inner product after inner product after inner product. Notice it's something like convolution, but it isn't convolution, it's called correlation. And we move this sliding window across here. And, for, and what we get is something that looks like this. That's what we get if we do, the, uh, do this correlation at every point. And the beautiful part about that is that this, uh, this gives exactly what we want. Here is the replication of this. And let's go to every point. And don't forget, we're just trying to find out if the pulse is positive or negative. So we see here, yeah, the pulse is positive. We see here that the pulse was positive. And uh, here the pulse was negative. And so we can go on and on and on. And if we're synchronized in our communication system, we can decode this in this example with 100% accuracy, which is kind of cool. And that is all due to this correlation operation. This is referred to as cross-correlation. Now, cross-correlation is, is given by the second equation there. And it isn't the same as convolution. Uh, what you do in what you do in correlation, well, convolution, you flip and shift. Remember, flip and shift. With correlation, you just shift. Or if it's complex, you conjugate and shift. So you conjugate and shift instead of flip and shift, and that's what you have in the equation, which is shown here. And we denote the correlation operation with a star. Usually, it's an asterisk that denotes convolution. So the question is, what is the best result that you can have? Look, if you have, if you if you do a little pulse, then if you correlate a pulse with a pulse, you get a triangle, right? So every time you do a correlation, you're going to get a triangle because a pulse correlated with a pulse is a triangle. What we would like is the correlation to be such that it was a like like a direct delta here. We would just like we would like to have zero on this side and zero on this side so that the correlation would identify uniquely where that result was. And we see this in the next slide. This is, this is an example where if you just use noise, this is random noise. Random noise actually has a good profile. Notice that it is peaked at the origin, right? And the side lobes are kind of nebulous. So therefore, it might be good to use this uh, instead of the rectangle as your coding operation. It does turn out that there, there are some optimal codes, and I'm presenting them here in discrete form. They also have a continuous form, but they're known as Barker codes. And here is an example of Barker codes. There are various sizes. The, only, the largest known Barker, Barker code is of length 13. But notice all of these, if you correlate this with itself, especially down to seven and 11, notice 11, by the way, 11 is uh, one of the IEEE standards for use in your cell phone. This is what you're using in your cell phone right now, a Barker code of a length 11. And if you correlate this with itself, look how beautiful the result is. When you overlap, you get a nice pulse. If you don't overlap, if you don't overlap, you're down here in the weeds and you're not going to have that pronounced result. So again, Barker codes are very powerful, but again, they're limited because they only have known solutions. Well, I think it's been proven that there's only known solutions up to 13. So let's do a Barker code result. Every time we have a one, we have a Barker code. Here we have a Barker code. Here we have a minus one. So we have the, the, the Barker code flipped upside down, right? We have minus the Barker code. Just like with the rectangles, we had a rectangle on top, 
Then we flipped it around. We had a rectangle in the bottom. Now we have a Barker code. And to get the negative, to get the minus one, we just have minus the Barker code. And so this is, this takes longer, right? Uh, but we have a number of Barker codes and they're either plus or minus one, depending on whether they're flipped or not. And if you do the noiseless variation of this, you get the result, which is shown here. Just a beautiful result. You get a very nice reconstruction. If you perform a correlation of this with a Barker code, you get this beautiful correlation that you have out here. But of course, we're interested in what happens if you add noise. And uh, without these little red dots here, I don't know if I would have any idea whether these were plus ones or minus ones. But if you take this and you perform a correlation with another Barker code, you get the beautiful result, which is shown here. And you can see with all the markers, it gets everything exactly right. A one, a one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, one, et cetera. So Barker codes are pretty powerful in terms of... Uh, sifting out signals in additive in, in, in noise, additive or not. Uh, Dr. Marks? Yes. Is there, is there a, a limit to uh, the integrity of your received signal based on SNR? Like if the noise is big enough, do you start to break down your signal? Oh, yes, yes. It? It's mm -hmm. just like everything in detection theory. There is a detection probability and a false alarm probability. Right. And it turns out that as the noise increases, the detection probability goes down and the false alarms go up and you can't avoid that. And eventually, eventually, if the noise gets large enough, you might as well flip a coin. Right. So this is just better than a lot of other types of signal. Well, um, it, it can act, match filters are actually shown without additional information about the signal are shown to be optimal. You cannot do better than a matched filter. Cool. In the presence of, in the presence of like Gaussian noise, uh, match filters are optimal. You can't do better than a matched filter. Okay, I think that uh, that, that kind of wraps things up. Next time we're going to look at other ways we can do correlation for edge detection. That edge detection will take us into Sobel operators, which will then take us into deep convolutional neural networks, okay? So I'm laying a path here to get to the deep convolutional neural networks. Uh, now, the next time we meet, I think we'll probably start at the beginning with Adam Goad talking about um, uh, talking about uh, what's he going to talk about? Oh, he's going to talk about uh, uh, simulated annealing and an example he has. That should, that should take 10, 15 minutes. And then I've asked um, Glauco Amigo, who does a lot of interesting work in neural networks, to explain to you the GAN, the Generative Adversarial Neural Network. And this is a type of neural network that you haven't seen before, which has made roads only in the last, I don't know, the last few years. And the GAN is the source of things such as deep fakes that you see. Um, and then uh, on the following Thursday, I've had uh, Dr. Justin Bowie just got his PhD. You were at an exam to explain to you some of the resources that are available on the web for training neural networks. It turns out for some reason, Amazon and Google and Everybody else has taken all of their wonderful uh, neural network training algorithms and made them available to the, to the world. And there's also places where you can go in order to get great training data. If you're trying to test a neural network and you want training data, there are websites to go to to get that. There's also websites, and everybody knows this who's a computer scientist, but there's websites that you can go to to download code that does that does certain things, and he's going to go over those uh, uh, on the following Thursday. Then we will return to these kernels, this correlation sort of idea, and we will talk about the deep convolution neural network. And I'll give you a little hint. The deep convolutional neural network is misnamed. Whoever named it didn't know the difference between correlation and convolution. It should be called the deep correlation neural network. And we'll find out why it should be called the Deep Correlation Neural Network when we talk about it. Okay, any questions at all? Uh, I have one. Is it possible they named it that? Because deep convolutional sounds better than deep correlational. 
<laughs> I guess it could be. It could be. I don't know the semantics. I suspect it was ignorance, though. Um, so I don't know. What do you do? You have to go along and continue the misnomer, but I refuse to do that. It's a deep correlation neural network, and we'll see why when we talk about it next time. Again, convolution is flip and shift. Correlation is, con uh, is conjugate and shift. Conjugate and shift instead of flip and shift. Okay. Okay, thank you, everybody. Take care and be of good cheer. Bye-bye. Uh, Dr. Marks? Yeah. Would you mind staying on for just a minute? Sure.